Okay, I'm going to call to order this meeting of the uh, Board of Regents um, special board meeting for February 16th, 2024. Uh, first item is roll call. Chair Carvalho. Here. Vice Chair Downs. Here. Regent Arascata. Here. Regent Boylan. Aye. Regent Brager. Here. Regent Brooks. Here. Regent Brown. Here. Regent Cruz Crawford. Regent Del Carlo. Here. Regent Goodman. Here. Regent McMichael. Here. Regent Perkins. Regent Tarkanian. Here. You have a quorum present. Thank you. First item on the agenda is public comment. For those who would like to call in and offer public comment, please dial 669-444-9171 and, and, and enter meeting ID 928-4944-5069 and passcode 555-5555. This information is also on, on the top of the agenda. I will ask for public comment from the meeting sites first. Is there public comment at GBC? There is no public comment at GBC at this time. Thank you. Is there any public comment at the system office in Reno? Yes, there is. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Jim New, N-E-W. I'm the president of the Nevada Faculty Alliance. Earlier this month, the NFA shared a resolution with you where we encourage you to revisit Title II, Chapter 1, Section 1 1.5 of the NC Code. This is a policy that has been incrementally changed over the last decade and now makes appointments of either an acting or interim president the primary method for filling presidential vacancies and demoting open searches. At all NC institutions, the standard practice for filling a faculty vacancy is to conduct a national search. This should be the minimum standard for filling a presidential vacancy. National searches embrace the principles of diversity, equity, inclusion, and shared governance, but unilateral appointments diminish them. Two community college presidents gave the board a full year's notice of their imminent departures and a third gave two years notice in exchange for a one-year contract extension and a waiver of their periodic evaluation. There was more than enough time to conduct national searches to fill the first two posts, but the existing code resulted in the board moving to make appointments instead. There is still ample time to conduct a national search for the vacancy that's coming at TMCC, and we encourage you to initiate the preliminary steps for that within the next two to three months and fill the uh, vacancy during the next academic year. We also encourage you to initiate national searches at GBC and CSN and allow the appointees to compete for the positions at the national level. Additionally, it is our request that you please revise the NC code to prioritize national searches to fill presidential vacancies and only make temporary appointments when there is inadequate time for a search. Thank you. Thank you. No other, no other comments? Thank you, I appreciate that. Public comment here at Las Vegas. Good afternoon, my name is Dr. Sandra Cosgrove. I'm a history professor at the College of Southern Nevada, and I'm here to speak on agenda item number seven, the recommendation to appoint an acting president to the College of Southern Nevada while the regents undertake a national search to find a permanent president. I would like to thank the chair for listening to the faculty who would like to take this opportunity to take the temperature at CSN and to find how faculty and staff envision our future going forward. Once an acting president is appointed, we need a process to provide every CSN employee the opportunity to share their experiences and their views without fear of retaliation. Again, thank you. Hello, Patrick Villa. Is it on? Sorry. Patrick Villa, um, CSN Faculty Senate Chairperson this year. Um, I'd like to speak on 
agenda items number six and seven. Number six, the uh, move of CSN, CSN Athletics to the new conference. Um, we, our Senate, have passed a resolution that we are wholly in favor of that. And we support that 100%, so please consider that. And number seven, we thank you for listening to us. And I'll point out that there would have been a lot more faculty here, but they're not always believing that you're listening to what we say. You know, we had a forum last year. We were very clear on what we wanted, what we didn't want for our president. And a lot of people felt that that was not heard, not listened to. So when I've asked people, come and support things, our faculty, they said, they're not going to listen to me anyway. So I'm going to try my best to speak on their behalf. Um, we're happy about the acting president um, from the, the registry, and we're glad that that is moving forward and that there hopefully will be an overlap so that they will be able to work with Dr. Zaragoza before he exits. And I will encourage you again, there is, you know, it's been almost, a, not a year, it's, it's been nine months or so since Dr. Zaragoza announced it. And as we heard from Jim New, no search happened permanently. It's definitely too late now to do it, but it's not too late to start that thing immediately. You do not need to wait until July or August or September to start a search, even if it's going to hire in July of 25. We can start that tomorrow. We can start that ASAP just in case, because things happen. I've seen it. Something comes up, there's a change in policies, there's a change in procedure, and I would just say, get as much done as you can now. You don't need to wait for the permanent search. So thank you all. Uh, Dr. Bill Robinson, Chair of the UNLV Faculty Senate. Um, I have a lot more to say that I can say in two minutes, but hopefully, perhaps maybe uh, we'll fit in some of that later. I get to see our faculty, staff, and students in their natural habitats. A lot of times administrators can't be Henry V and they can't go put on student clothes and go walking around campus. Their, their presence changes the, the universe that they see. And um, seeing the polar bear or the lion in the zoo is not the same as seeing them out on the Serengeti or up in the... Um, Arctic. A storm came to our campus and it has changed the face of Arrakis. We, there is no such thing as getting back to normal. That normal is gone. There is a new normal that we have to build and we have to believe that that's what we have to do, that there is a new normal that we have to build. And if you do not believe me, when we're done on, or on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, go over to the campus and just go into the student union and look at Starbucks. It used to be the fall, I did not go to Starbucks once because the lines were around and around and then out into the hall. Yesterday, prime class time, I walked into Starbucks, there were two people in line. The students are coming to campus, they're going home. They're not part of the campus right now. You can see it. And the faculty are the same way. Most of the faculty are kind of sort of around the campus, but they're not really back into the campus. Um, we have all kinds of issues about what's going to happen in the fall and what we're going to do in between. It's already February. If we're going to go out to bid and do something, if we're going to make a significant change, we're already on the edge of too late to get it done in time for fall. So I'm urging you to encourage folks that you see to push, to really think about what's going on and to push. Thanks. Good afternoon, regents, presidents, and those in the gallery. My name is Dr. Arnold Bell. I'm a professor of communication at the College of Southern Nevada. First and foremost, I want to say thank you very much for listening to the concerns of individuals like myself and countless others at the College of Southern Nevada. I would like to say that by utilizing the registry to identify an acting president for the College of Southern Nevada is the best move you can make during these crisis times. As stated in the registry's website, at these times, you need a trusted partner that understands your needs and can connect you to an experienced and vetted network of talented higher educational professionals. By deploying the professional services of the registry, excuse me, candidates credentials can be properly vetted in an unbiased fashion, thus eradicating the speculations of secretive, ill-advised concessions 
laden with cronyism and nepotism-like behavior. This board specifically sets the tone of selecting highly qualified individuals that will eventually lead institutions like CSN, TS, TMCC, as well as GBC. Incorporating the services of registries should be the gold standard approach when instituting best practices when identifying presidential candidates. Again, I commend your timely decision in defining this moment because it exudes the utmost ethical intention with the greatest resounding integrity. With this in mind, I respectfully ask this board to move in an expeditious fashion by changing item agenda seven from an informational only to an action item today, which allow you to move in a very progressive fashion. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your consideration. And again, congratulations well in the voting of the new chair. That's it. Thank you. Seeing no other public comment in Las Vegas, SCS, is there any public comment on the phone? Yes, Madam Chair, we do have one. Caller with the phone number ending in 1230, please, please press star six to unmute, state your name and spell it for the record, and you will have two minutes to address the board. They're not unmuting with Madam Chair. Is there any other comment on the phone? No, Madam Chair, not at this time. Thank you. We'll move on to item number two, audit compliance and Title IX committee report. This is for possible action, but before we do, I'd like to uh, give uh, committee chair Joe Arascata, a few moments to briefly go over um, the committee's uh, vote today. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is going to be very brief. <clears throat> this will be very brief. I move approval of the committee recommendation and acceptance of this report. The report is going to be highlighted by Lauren Tripp. Thank you much. I have a motion on the floor to approve um, the committee report. Do I have a second? Uh, I'll take the second from Regent Del Carlo. Any additional comment, questions? I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number three, ad hoc committee for a review of the policies governing a search for chancellor report. Uh, I will briefly go to um, committee chair Brager for that. Thank you very much. Susan Brager for the record. Uh, the committee reviewed the current, well, uh, let me start with um, special counsel Michael B. Wixom provided a brief overview of the open meeting laws that relates to the chancellor searches. The committee reviewed the current po search policy and gave direction to staff to prepare a policy uh, based on the discussion that we had. The committee reviewed the policy proposals, code revisions, vacancy in the office of the chancellor, Title II, Chapter 1, Section 1.5.4, Item 3A, procedures and guidelines, manual revisions, appointments and vacancies of system, off system officers, Chapter 2, Section 1, Item 3B. The committee concurred with the proposals as prevented by staff, and um, that's what we did. <laughs> Thank you for that report. I will entertain a motion. Admit, oh, go ahead. Jeff. Second. I'll say so move. My mic will turn on. Thank you. Um, motion from Vice Chair Downs, and I think I had a second from Regent McMichael. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Thank you. We'll move on to item number four, proposed revisions policies governing a search for the, I'm sorry, I'm, that's number four, we're going, nope. We are on number four, I, I apologize. Um, so this will be the first reading of, of this change and to get into that a little bit more deeply, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Wixom. Uh, thank you, Chair Carvalho. For the record, Michael Wixom, uh, Special Board Counsel. On December 12, 2023, 
the subcommittee, the special committee of the board that was addressing changes to the chancellor's search policy met and had lengthy and, and I thought productive and rich discussions about the search policies and procedures. And I was given the task of trying to take, of taking their comments and concerns and questions and ideas and crafting changes to the policies and to the handbooks surrounding the chancellor search. And I've done my best to do that. I went back and listened to the audio of the meeting and I read the minutes and I tried carefully to track through all of the concerns and questions and ideas. The product of what I did is attached and to your agenda before you. I also had very helpful input from Kerry Nikolajowski, from Chair Brager, from Chancellor Charlton, and from Jimmy Martinez, and also from uh, Chair Carvalho, as I went through and crafted these policies to make sure I was being responsive. And, and they had some excellent ideas, and we had a great deal of back and forth. Uh, I'm not going to go through those changes on a line-by-line -line basis that didn't seem a particularly productive exercise. They're in front of you, and I'm certainly available for any specific questions that you may have. I wanted to give you an idea of some of the themes I had in making these changes. The first was clarity. I was searching for clarity in the policy. It isn't as clear as I would like it, but it's, I think, clearer than it was before. Uh, another theme I had was simplicity. It's not as simple as I would have liked it, but it's simpler, I think, than it was before. It's easier to follow, I believe. Another theme was inclusion, both inclusion as far as the regents are concerned, and I'll explain that more in detail, but also inclusion from the community in a productive way. Uh, there are some specific changes I'd like to highlight in that regard. At the specific request of the committee, the committee that's appointed to conduct a chancellor search will now participate under these proposed policy changes in the selection of a search consultant. That was uh, a, a clear wish of the committee that we they have that opportunity and so they do have that opportunity now under the proposed changes. I've also tried to structure the inclusion of the advisory committee in a productive way. Those of you who have participated in searches know that sometimes if we have as I've seen as many as 35 or 40 people as part of an advisory committee and when you get that many people on an advisory committee there's not much advice. I mean, it's difficult to participate in a productive way. I used an arbitrary figure based on my experience, and that was 20. It seemed to me that 20 wasn't too big and it wasn't too small. It gave us the opportunity to include representatives from the campus, from the presidents, from the community at large, from the foundation, but not yet become so unwieldy that those who participate feel like they weren't participating. I, I know that a number of those individuals on advisory committees in the past have expressed their personal frustration to me because they felt like they weren't heard because they couldn't say anything. And so we, we tried to streamline that process to make it, to make it more productive. I, I shared with the committee earlier uh, a quote from President Glick when he was president of UNR when I was on the board. He said, Mike, never confuse efficiency and effectiveness. In fact, I even have his photograph on my desk at home, so I don't forget that. So don't confuse efficiency in effect with effectiveness. And I've tried to be efficient, but I've also tried to find a sweet spot between efficiency and effectiveness. Now, with that said, I'm certainly open to any specific questions that you may have and ideas that you may have. This is the first reading of these policy changes under, our, under the code that you operate under. We'll need a second reading before this would become effective. And so this is open to you for questions. It's open to the public, and I'm open to any concerns or questions or ideas that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Wixom. Um, I'll go to Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair Carvalho. I came in late and I missed some of the discussion, but did I read it right that whoever our acting or interim chair, chancellor is at the time, when there is a search, they're going to be able to help select the consultant? Did I read that right? Or understand that right? Well, they're going to participate in the process because, and we had that discussion, Michael Wixom for the record, by the way, that was a regent, a question that Regent Carvalho had as we were going through this process. And she asked me why we had included the chancellor in that process. They're not there to help search the search consultant or to select the search consultant. That's the prerogative of the committee. 
but they are part of the process because they're the chief contracting officer for the system. And so they, they need to be part of the process because they have to sign the contract, whoever that person is. And if for whatever reason that chancellor isn't in place at the time, if, if, for, if for whatever reason they may be gone or ill or they vacated a position, then the chief uh, acting officer uh, would, would step into that role in accordance with board policy. Chief, excuse, chief acting officer. Oh, whoever. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the officer in charge, I'm sorry. The officer in charge. You have policies in place now, so that if the chancellor is out of state or unavailable or ill or incapacitated, that the officer in charge would take over as chancellor and operate as chancellor. So you, you have that protection in place now. I, I'm really dense here, but can you explain that protection again? Because I'm concerned, and absolutely no offense to our interim right now, but if that person is putting in for the job, how can they be part of both processes? Well, they would Am I missing be, something? Thank well, you. they have to participate to the extent that they're the contracting officer. So we need the chancellor there to sign the contract. So they have to participate in the process to the extent that uh, administratively they go through the process. They would not participate in the search process. They would not participate in selecting the consultant because that would be the prerogative of the board. So it's, it's merely an administrative function, and that's the sole purpose in having them in that place at that time. Okay, Is just it, for clarification, they're just signing the contract. Yes, they would just be signing the contract, okay. participating in the administrative. They have to be part of the consulting process because they have, to, they have to execute the contract. They don't select the search firm. They don't participate in the search. They're there for administrative purposes only. Okay, because my first thought was, I know there's that letter where the interim acting or the chancellor has three people that are lined up in case they can't do their job or out of town or whatever. Because my first thought was, well, why wouldn't that person take themselves completely out and give it to their number one person to sign? But Well, and it's an excellent question, and I think it highlights part of the administrative challenges that you face whenever you're crafting these kinds of policies. So again, just to emphasize, they, the chancellor is named as part of that process solely for administrative and procedural purposes. They would not participate in the substantive selection of the search consultant. That's the prerogative of the committee. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or uh, concerns from any regions? I, I would like to just add one, one um, note, and I, I appreciate Regent Del Carlo's concern. It was the same that I had, basically. Um, at, we do have, as a board, um, the ability to deviate from any of this, uh, the, our policies with a two-thirds vote. So if there were, a, a, in, in my mind, hearing what you're saying, and, and probably in the same vein that I was thinking, if we did have a, a, a concern in that way, there would be a possibility to take the chancellor out of that that group of three and add somebody else, and then the, the chancellor um, could could be that contracting officer. But we can we could make that change if we felt that it was important at that time. Correct. Thank Mr. you, Michael Wixon, for the record, Chair Carvello. That's exactly correct. I mean, you do have that flexibility, and it would be part of the charge that that the board would give when it when it impaneled the search committee. And so you can, as part of the overall determination about the scope of the search and the nature of the search. It, we had this discussion earlier in response to a question from Regent Arascata. If you try to plan for every eventuality, you're going to miss something. And, and by keeping a degree of flexibility in the way that your policies are crafted now, you do have that flexibility. And so you could make that determination. And two-thirds of the board could say, no, we don't think that's appropriate. And you could address Regent Del, Del, Carlo, Del, Car Del Carlo's question at the time that you create the committee and say, we don't think that's right. And you, the, it would go forward on that way. And that, <clears throat> it's the same reason, and this was in response to a question that Regent Goodman had earlier, if we sh what about the acting interim, if, if, should we address that issue as part of this process? And, I, I actually considered that, but I didn't think that was the appropriate time or place to address that. that 
acting, the issue of acting interim and whether or not they can apply all of that is a separate and discrete issue. And, and I'm afraid that by trying to combine them, we would confuse the two issues. I think we're better off keeping them separate <clears throat> and as straightforward as, as we can and with that flexibility in mind. And it's the same issue that you face about the timing of a search. When should a church be complete? But what time of year should you do a search? When should, you need some flexibility because situations could change, in my view. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions or concerns on item number four? This is a first reading, so um, this will come back to the board at a later date um, for possible action. I'll move on to item number five, Chancellor's Ad Hoc Committee on Public Safety. Uh, I'll first um, have Ch Chancellor Charlton introduce this. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, and thank you so much, Chair Carvalho. For the record, Patty Charlton, Interim Chancellor, Nevada System of Higher Education. Um, so uh, following the events of December the 6th, uh, we created under the, the Chancellor's authority an ad hoc committee on public safety. And at that time, um, sent out communication to the board and asked uh, Vice President Garcia, Chief Garcia, Director Garcia, he wears many, many hats and titles, um, to chair that group, um, representative of every institution, our stakeholder um, uh, complement within the system, including faculty senate, uh, classified council, students, as well as ask the NFA to be a part of this conversation, and external representatives, including the Governor's Office of Emergency Management, as well as Chief James from UNR. And so um, today, we would like to be able to provide an update on the status of what is going, what has happened to date with that ad hoc committee, and then also at all of your subsequent meetings, um, we will be having an update. If there's the security committee, um, we will have it at that regular quarterly meeting, and if not, we will have a special agenda item, and I wanted to thank the chair for acknowledging um, our request for that, and then also for Regent McMichael, um, who is the chair of the security committee, who is engaged and participating with this uh, committee. And so with that, I'd like to turn it to um, Vice President Garcia, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Carvalho, Vice Chair Downs, Regents, uh, Chancellor Charlton, Presidents, and fellow colleagues. Uh, for the record, my name is Adam Garcia, Vice President, Public Safety Services, and Director of University Police Southern Command. Uh, as the Chancellor uh, said, I will be providing a very brief update on the activities of the Chancellor's Ad Hoc Committee on Public Safety. Uh, the committee was convened uh, in response to the active shooter incident that took place at UNLV on December 6th. The intent of the committee uh, is to identify areas for improvement in campus safety and emergency readiness system-wide, uh, to initiate measures to address those identified uh, concerns, identify possible funding sources, and review policies and procedures that are related to campus safety initiatives. There are 18 committee members, uh, and uh, this includes a representative from each NC institution that was appointed by their respective president, the governor's office, the chancellor's office, uh, security committee uh, chair McMichael, uh, Northern Command Chief Eric James, a representative from Nevada Student Alliance, a representative from the chair of chairs, a representative from a Nevada Faculty Alliance, and a representative from Classified Council. Following uh, the initial meeting of uh, the committee, subcommittees were formed in order to address specific issues. These sub subcommittees are uh, emergency communications, threat intelligence and management, physical security that includes access control, video surveillance, and infrastructure, financial models, budget requests, and governmental affairs. This includes state uh, and local, as well as federal and private funding sources, emergency management, training, law enforcement, and public safety operations, as well as interagency collaborations. At our inaugural meeting, it was agreed that the following three milestones would apply to our work. Number one, 
we look at the short term. What can we achieve in the first six months? The second milestone is midterm. What can we achieve in the following six to 12 months? And the third is long term. What can we accomplish in 12 months and beyond? My commitment to the chancellor and to you and to our campuses is that to the extent that I can control it, this will be an action committee. I do not want to be meeting in two years still talking about the same thing. This will be an action committee to the extent that I can control it. I think our campuses deserve better than talk. I was there on 12-6. Our campuses deserve better than just talk. To that point, the committee in the first few weeks of existence has done a number of things. We've re reviewed several policies that we hope to bring forward for review and approval, as well as implementation. We have identified several possible funding sources that, we, that may become available in the next few months. And this, the committee through subcommittee chair Brad Jensen has identified and reviewed a possible solution to remote locking technology for doors that are on the Millennium, uh, the Millennium uh, process. The chancellor has asked the, that the full board be given an update on the progress of the committee at each special uh, and as well as each quarterly meeting, which I will provide. In addition, I am meeting regularly with the chancellor and her staff to receive guidance and support as this process continues to evolve. Uh, I am grateful for the continued support of you, the board, the chancellor, and all of our presidents. And I also want to recognize uh, the hard work of the committee. They've already been hard at work. So that concludes my report for this first uh, update, and I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Vice President Garcia. Um, Regent Boylan. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Vice President Garcia. Appreciate that. You said this is going to be an action committee. What exactly do you mean by that? What action are you going to take? Well, <clears throat> I've established the three milestones. So, you know, in the first six months, what are we going to be able to do? Are there policies that can be changed? Is there equipment? Is there infrastructure? Is there technology that can be implemented in that time, or, or at least we begin uh, moving forward at, at uh, approaching um, those those issues, those technology issues, the safety issues? Uh, can we implement uh, processes? that we don't have now. What can we do to make our campuses safer in that six month period? What is the low hanging fruit that we can approach and that we can get? Obviously funding, everything that we do is gonna depend on funding, not everything but most things. And so uh, when I talk about an action committee, once again, I don't wanna be talking about this in a year or two. I want things done now. I want things that we can accomplish in the short term. And to me, the short term really is a year. Uh, I understand that given infrastructure uh, processes, the length of time it takes for things to go to bid, it may take longer than that. And that's why I've established those three milestones. The six months, what can we do in that six month period of time? What can be, we do in the first year? And then beyond that, what, what can we do into the future? Okay, thank you. I have a few more questions. Uh, so that's basically planning action that you're taking so far, which is good. I, I'm, I like that. Now, you talked about identification of funding sources. Uh, I'd like to know, because I, I know most of this board doesn't know it, some of us do, how many doors were broken in that building one of the reasons why it's closed. I've asked for reasons why it's closed. I have had no answer. And I won't mention the people that I've written that to that give me why, why is the building closed? So 
when we see these funding sources, is it possible to get funding from Metro? Because they broke all those doors uselessly, in my opinion. When we had the shooting at Mandalay Bay, only one door was broken. But they come here, and I find out today that they even put uh, weapons in the faces of uh, faculty, not knowing who they were, which is all police procedures and what they knew or they were trained. So is there any way that we can get funding from Metro? And can I ask counsel that? Yeah, pardon for the interruption, Linda King, Associate General Counsel. We have agendized just the activities of the committee, a report on the activities. So if funding isn't a part of those activities, that wouldn't be properly agendized to discuss today. Oh, I, I see. It's, so it's based on funding. He talked about funding, so I'm asking that question. And I'm asking it mainly of Patty Char uh, uh, Interim Chancellor Charlton and him. Right, and, if the, and I'm letting him know that if that's a, uh, one of the activities to report upon, that's proper. But the other commentary um, is not. So we cannot make that, I cannot make that commentary that can we ask Metro for some of the funding for the damage they did? No. Is that what you're saying? I won't make that comment. I take it back. All right. So the other thing I'm going to address. Yep. Yeah, sorry, ma'am. You have to say something. Go ahead. Yeah. No. So just for the record, Patty Charlton, interim chancellor, Nevada System of Higher Education. So in response to your to your question regarding um, funding as it relates to the repairs, we have insurance within the system, and that um, has been addressed, and that is in deployment right now, going through an RFP process. And so I can answer that. And then we have other funding requests that we are working closely with, not just the governor's office, but we will also be working with our federal delegation on some of the strategies um, that come from word, forward from the committee. Thank you. Uh, so, well, like council said, I can't ask why can't we get money back from Metro. So I won't ask that question. The other thing is... Jim Boylan, the, the, Linda King again. The funding question is appropriate. The commentary on the conduct or actions of the Metro... Uh, Police department is not. No, that, that's why I said it because it's like we can get funding because it was their actions that broke all these doors. That's why I said it. And I take it back. Now, the other thing I had was uh, uh, Professor Robinson said there was hardly anybody in the student union at the coffee place. Well, they're not going to be there. The main building in that campus with over, I don't know, dozens of classrooms is closed. We've got this reason it's been closed because maybe you can let me know if I'm saying the right thing. Because it's bad for the people, for the students, because someone was shot and killed there. But faculty and staff are allowed in there. Isn't it bad for them? But, but they're allowed, but the students are not allowed. And we haven't fixed those doors yet. We haven't got this. We did the same thing to students in COVID, under COVID rules and regulations and all kinds of nonsense. So after this semester, that building will be opened. So then it's all right for students. They'll have no psychological problems. I, I don't understand this. Why is a big building like that with so many classrooms, so many students, and again, we are telling them go to different rooms, go on the internet and take your classes. We're not getting any answers. This is an extremely important thing for higher education. Regent and I've Boylan. been trying to, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Yeah, Linda King, for the record again. I think that the items that you're pointing out would be more properly addressed in new business as, items, new business. That, as items that you wish for the committee that uh, Vice President Garcia is speaking about that yeah. you wish for that committee to consider. And that we should not be holding a complete discussion about those, those okay. items right now. Would you consider that in the committee, the things that I said, that's what my questions are. Would you please address them in your committee and then bring it back to us? I have to ask it in new business, I know. But he's talking about it right now. I'm all confused. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a simple man. I get confused easily. Thank you so much. And bring it, sh shut the, you know, what up, I guess. You'll pray for me, thank you. So would you please uh, address these things in in your committee and I'll bring it up in new business like I've been told. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair Carvalho. You said something about um, locking on millennium, millennium process. 
What's a Millennium process? I didn't know what you were talking about. That's really just the technology yeah, yeah, yeah. that's used for uh, doors that don't require a hard key. Okay. I didn't get that, so thank you for the clarification. Of course. Regent Brooks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Regent Brooks, for the record. Oh. Uh, first, thank you again for everything that, that, that you have done um, regarding all the implementation conversations, working as part of the committee to outline you know, positive changes for the campus and, and student experience. You spoke about reporting and you divide that up into three different areas, that, that short term, mid term and long term. In terms of the reporting itself, is there a, a measure in which you're taking a look at that that very specific reporting would come back to the board or is there a general reporting that will come back to the board? And I'm just interested in, 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 in having a better understanding of what the reporting processes would be and what they may or may not include. Uh, Adam Garcia for the record, thank you for that question. Uh, my intent is to bring back as much information as appropriate for the board to be, um, uh, to, to, to have their knowledge on what we're doing and what processes, what progress is taking place uh, NCY-wide at, at all of the campuses. So uh, my report, while it's brief today, uh, I'm assuming that as we move forward uh, in the, the committee meetings that the um, information that you'll be provided will be much more extensive than what I'm provided today. We've only met twice uh, overall for probably about six hours. Uh, many of that was establishing the charge ensuring that the, uh, the subcommittee chairs were informed of what it was that I want them to, uh, to do and address. And so they're, all, uh, as I said earlier, hard at work at gathering the information so that we can discuss it within the committee and the subcommittees and then come back to the board and provide information to you. Much more extensive information. Thank you, I appreciate that. I don't, I don't have anything further, Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you, Vice President. Garcia, are there any other questions or comments from board members? Before we move on, I'd like to, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Regent McMichael. Yes, I wanted to um, uh, applaud the committee uh, and the members and the subcommittees, uh, how quickly they be, uh, have come together to uh, address these situations and hopefully in the future, we won't even need a committee because uh, uh, maybe we won't even have a situation like this happen again, but we're trying to answer and come up with solutions uh, for now and for the future. And so I, I wish to thank uh, Vice President Garcia and uh, the rest of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Regent McMichael. Uh, Regent Boylan. Boylan, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I really want to thank you, uh, uh, Vice President Garcia. I didn't mean to throw that at you as, hey, tell me these answers right now. They were basically suggestions, and I appreciate how much you've done by putting such a big committee together. And I'm, I bet you will see some good results. Bring them to us. That's all. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Vice President Garcia. Before we move on, um, I would just like to offer um, UNLV Faculty Senate Chair Dr. Bill Robinson a few moments if he would like to provide any comments. Ms. Thomas, welcome. Hi, thank you. Uh, Nicole Thomas, GPSA President for the record. Um, I haven't been to one of these since December 6th, um, speaking as an actual student who was actually on campus that day. Um, frankly, I've been handling things, I thought, pretty well up until we start talking about them. Um, I've, it, it's difficult being there. I'm there every day because of my job and because I care about the students and I kind of bare knuckle my way through a lot of things. Um, but I still have nightmares. And that's something that I think a lot of our people are still dealing with that's incredibly difficult to get over um, in situations like that. So I appreciate the work that you all are doing to 
make considerations here. Um, I ask that we continue to be compassionate and understanding of both our students and faculty. Some people are completely fine. I've talked to individuals who are ready to go, right, ready to be back in the building. Some people are not. Um, just this morning, I responded to a student email who said that they were a graduate assistant who was locked down on the third floor of BEH. You know, for a few hours in that building, hearing shots, hearing their colleagues um, who are no longer with us, you know, and that's something that I think we have to be really cognizant of when we talk about these different types of things. I don't have solutions. Um, I wish that I did. That's something that, you know, I like coming up here with different ideas and things like that. Um, I think the most that we can do is restore a sense of safety and a sense of community. So I really appreciate you all taking the time and understanding that it does take time for people to heal. Um, some people will be at different stages throughout the next six months, the next year, on whether or not they're ready to return to different parts of campus, myself included. Um, I've been in that building for a healing ceremony, and it was actually really beautiful. Um, but these are things that I think we need to open up to other individuals and understand that people process things at different rates. Um, other suggestions that students have recommended, more lighting on campus, increased security presence, these are all tangible things that we could do to restore that sense of security. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been hard, um, you know, and that's something that I, even now I'm kind of at a loss for words because, thanks Bill. <laughs> um, but the administration has been genuinely supportive in trying to work with us in terms of, you know, figuring out what we can do. Um, if I could have been on the safety committee, I would have been. I love being on committees, but honestly, <laughs> you know me. Um, but I, I just couldn't talk about it anymore. I couldn't deal with it. It was one of those things where I just needed to kind of process things on my own. Um, and I think up until you've been in a situation like that, it's really, really difficult to conceptualize what you would or wouldn't have done. Um, so I just appreciate you all taking the time to consider this and whatever we can do to make it better and make people feel more comfortable, I'm all in. So. Thank you, President Thomas. So Chair Carvalho, just for the record, Patty Charlton again, Interim Chancellor for the System. Um, while we have this Chancellor's Ad Hoc Committee on Public Safety, I, did, I would be remiss if I didn't also add that each of our institutions have, in some form or fashion, either had already in existence a Safety and Security Committee or have reinstituted or reestablished um, and expanded safety and security committee to address some of the, the issues at hand and also that their input will be feeding back into this larger committee um, that will be bringing recommendations to you for policy changes. But there are things that they're moving on um, immediately, which um, Vice President Garcia will be uh, reporting back to you. One of the things I will tell you that was at the very top of the list was training. And training across the, the institutions, emergency notification, and actually, we want to ensure that you also have a part of that emergency notification system so that you know things that are happening and to establish a, a system-wide platform. So those are some of the things that are in process. But our presidents um, have, one, been very, very supportive, have engaged. Um, they've heard the concerns from their faculty, staff, their students. And especially for NSHE, it's also our community. We are open campuses. We are very, very much a part of our community. And so we want to ensure that everything is, um, that we can do is being done. Thank you, Chancellor. Dr. Robinson. Uh, thank you, Chair Carvalho. Uh, Bill Robinson, Chair of the Only Faculty Senate. Um, the, the Chief talked about this being a phased, we can do this budget, and, and that's the real issue for me, for you, is what belongs in the phases of the phases. Uh, just to give you an Enchi thing, remember that when the, this went down on December 6th, the police left those three campuses that are sitting right here to rush over to mine. We are lucky that nothing happened on those three campuses, and he's got like six of his own. Those campuses all of a sudden were uncovered. That's something that needs to be dealt with sooner rather than later. So what belongs in each one of those? Uh, BEH right now, it's locked and there's armed security walking around that building. That is a different environment than if that building is open and everyone can pass in it. Idaho tore down the building their shooting was in. Virginia Tech never reopened it to students, retasked it, 
as an administration, our Michigan State is reopening their building this semester, and it's been a sea of student protests against it. We are about to start registering students, and we will be unable, we're going to open that building, and we can't tell the students whether they're going to take a class in BEH or not, but we're going to ask them to register for class. Uh, that's unacceptable to me. I've said that's unacceptable to, to my administration, and hopefully we can fix those. But those are all, are we fixing this in a year? Are we fixing this particular thing in 18 months? Are we figuring this in six months? And there's a whole bunch of things I think we need to get done in six months, and it's going to be very difficult for the committees to do that. But we really need to prioritize what really is a six-month issue versus a 12-month issue and an 18-month issue. That six-month list needs to be a lot longer than I think it is. Um, and that's really what I want to say. I have a whole bunch of specific examples, but I'm going to skip that because I don't want her to yell at me. Um, but the board needs to get a handle on six-month, 12-month, 18-month, and figure out what really belongs. As he said, this is, this is, this is what really belongs there. And I know you can't do that today because we didn't agendize doing that today. But that's what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. I think you have a question from Regent Boylan, a very short, brief question. <laughs> People can hear me even if I don't have the mic on. I do know that we need more police officers. I've been a big proponent for that. Instead of all the admin positions that we keep filling at very high cost to us, the young student, the young lady just came there and she mentioned we need more lighting and more police presence. I've always agreed with that. We need a lot of things. We are extremely good at, after the fact, fixing things. I ask the difficult questions and I suggest the difficult things because I want to have it before the fact. Yes, some of us have been in situations to be shot at. I think Brooks and maybe uh, uh, McMichael here also, I have. So we know what it's like. It's, it's a difficult, bad situation, and we need more police officers. But uh, more lighting is like the students, students said, people are still afraid. Why is that building being protected with armed officers are you expecting something else to happen, or are you just protecting the building, not you? I'm yeah. asking this in general, right? I can ask that, and right? Why are we, you're telling us that there's armed police there, there's armed officers there. What are you doing, protecting the building after the fact? Yeah, it, Linda King, Associate General Counsel for the yes, record. Um, you, you asked if this was appropriate commentary. Um, it, it, is, it is not, you can discuss, we are in a, uh, the chair has exercised her discretion to allow public comment on this agenda item. Um, so we can, you, the discussion, the board can have discussion around that public comment. Um, so if, to the extent so, that your comments oh, deal actually, with can, what can I say Robinson, that we're not public comment? It's not that public the Board comment. of Regents Handbook allows yeah. the chair to include faculty senate chairs and student government leaders in the discussion. Okay. So this isn't yeah, public, not public comment. comment. We're, also, we're also good on the I know, the, I know, I know. I just, just want to clarify yeah. for you that the handbook but it would need is, to relate. we're not public um, It would need to relate, and I also don't believe that Mr. Robinson knows the answer to that uh, question. Okay. So yeah. I'd be happy to discuss that with you we, when we take we a break. We really should, and I'll bring it up in... Because uh, I do actually know the answer. Oh, good. Awesome. New business. Is that... I can bring it up in new business? Ask that. Bring it to us. We can do everything. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Brief quit. Yes, Brief. Thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you again, Vice President Garcia, for giving that report. We'll move on to item number six, NJCAA region change for CSN athletics. And for this, I'll, I'll uh, have Dr. President Zaragoza introduce it. Thank you. Madam Chair, Regents, Chancellor, colleagues, and guests, uh, for the record, Federico Zaragoza, President of the College of Nevada. And thank you for this opportunity uh, to bring this item uh, to this uh, special board meeting, uh, time is of the essence. Uh, so um, as we begin our, our deliberations on moving from NJCCA uh, Region 18 to Region 1, uh, this request uh, has been vetted uh, by all of the uh, CSN stakeholders. Uh, this request benefits our students 
and it includes significant cost savings to CSN. So without further ado, uh, here to present item number six is our fantastic uh, CSN Athletic Director, Yvonne Waite, uh, and also CSN Institutional Effectiveness Officer, Dr. Martin Margo. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Car Carvalho and all the members of the board. I appreciate your willingness to hear me out on this uh, agenda item. Um, my name is Yvonne Wade. I'm the new Director of Athletics at the College of Southern Nevada, and I appreciate Dr. Zee for allowing me in this role. Um, I'm here today to re request support from you all to allow CSN to move from the NJCA Region 18 into Region 1. Currently, we have 10 sports as members of the Region 18 and Scenic West Athletic Conference that include a large territory of member colleges in the states of Utah, Colorado, Idaho, and Washington. Region 1, however, is comprised of only Arizona colleges. This request to move from Region 18 and Scenic West Conference to Region 1 is motivated by several compelling factors that directly impact the welfare and performance of our student athletes, as well as the financial stability of our athletic department. First, the escalating strain of our budget due to extensive travel to the member institutions in Region 18 has become unsustainable. CSN Athletics budget is currently driven by a $2 student fee and because enrollment declines, that has impacted our budget greatly. The cost associated with transportation, hotel accommodations, and other related expenses has created more pressure on our resources. Secondly, the prolonged periods of time spent on the road significantly impact the performance of our student athletes. Demanding travel schedules not only contribute to physical and mental fatigue, but also distribute, disrupt essential routines of training regimen and compromise their ability to compete at an optimal level in their designated sports and ultimately affect their overall experiences at CSN. Most importantly, the excessive time spent away from the classroom due to extended travel commitments pose significant challenges to our student athletes with affect their learning experiences. By relocating to Region 1, we hope to mitigate these issues and provide our student athletes with a more conducive environment to excel both academically and athletically. In light of those reasons, I humbly request your support for this move to Region 1. This move not only alleviates the financial strain to our institution, but also enhances the overall well-being and success of our student athletes. And without that, I'll take questions if you have any. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Regent Brown. Thank you. Uh, Regent Brown, for the record. Um, when I was reading over the document, and, and uh, the president and yourself just said it, this makes it more accessible. It increases participation and saves us money. Um, those seem like all three very valid, amazing reasons. My only question is, do we cut any competitive advantage by limiting our scope to just Arizona instead of other states? Um, competitive advantage, no. Be both Region 18 and Region 1 are... Um, we'll be competing in Division I um, at the Division I level. So there are high competitive opportunities in both areas. Um, we are considered a Division I institution right now, although we are not funded as such. So it's going to be tough both ways, to be honest. Um, but the, the reduced travel time, uh, time away from class, um, is going to significantly help our student athletes quite a bit. And in your opinion, you feel like they're going to get the same exposure? Um, I think they'll get more exposure, honestly. You know, we're in a region where Arizona is closer to us. Yeah. Our fans will travel both ways. A lot of times, Arizona schools come to us anyway. And we'll still continue okay. those uh, relationships with the Region 18 that are close, the Salt Lakes and the, you know, the, the trips that are four or five hours away. But it's just the new colleges that are in northern Idaho and in Kennewick, Washington. <laughs> those are 16-hour bus rides. And we don't have the funding to fly like they do. So, Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I do feel like... A lot of people forget that student athletes are first and foremost students yes. and the travel time and, and the excessive, you know, time it takes from point A to point B, not to mention all the training. So being able to cut that down, my only, you know, and again, to, uh, division one to, to division one, you're probably going to get the same exposure just as long as they're going to get the same you know, opportunities to grow and, and be challenged. Then Absolutely. it seems like a no brainer yes. for me personally. Thank you. Thank you. Regent McMichael. Uh, yes, I, I think this is a great opportunity for the students and uh, motion to approve. Second. So I have a motion from Regent McMichael, a second from Regent Goodman. I know that there are some others who also have some questions. So um, I, I'll go to Regent Downs and then Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair Carvalho. 
I want to echo and applaud what Regent Brown had said. Uh, you make a really good point about the competitiveness and maintaining that in the um, for the students. And just by, I mean, it sounds like this is a very popular opinion to go with this anyway. Uh, but just the rough numbers that I've come up with, it's around eight on average, eight hours and <clears throat> fifteen minutes to drive or to drive to the the is it eighteen versus the five hours and ten minutes or so to drive to the ones in Arizona on average. So I think it makes a lot of sense. And do they ever fly, or is it always taking buses? No, we always take buses or vans, minivans, okay. to be honest. So I think it makes sense. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair Carvalho. I thought it was a really well thought out business plan. It makes sense. And I agree with our, my colleague, Regent Brown, that they're, they're students first. And I can't imagine a 15 hour and 14 minute bus ride. That would really be painful, but uh, I do wonder what have the students said? Have they are they happy about this? Because I don't I don't remember reading anything in there about their, what they're saying. And to me, I'm like Dr. Z says, students first. <laughs> so what are they saying? Uh, Yvonne Wade, for the record, uh, yes, uh, our basketball team just recently returned from Northern Idaho, um, and it was a tough ride. <laughs> they got kind of veered off. Weather is bad, so they're normally six hour trip turned into a 14 hour trip and they missed the Super Bowl and you know all of that stuff. So they would be definitely uh, in favor of shorter bus rides. <laughs> Did I hear you right? You said they missed the Super Bowl? Yes. Oh, this that's the reason alone to, <laughs> to vote for this, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Athletic Director Wade. I appreciate that. that. Thank you. So we have Chair a- Carballo. Oh yes, please, Regent Arascata. Thank you. Um, AD, I was just curious, what would the cost savings be between the current uh, the current travels to the proposed travels? So current, Yvonne, wait for the record, currently our travel budget um, amongst all 10 of our sports is roughly just under $500,000 for all of those sports. Um, we've done kind of preliminary budgets um, based on those things, and it, it, we'd probably... 20 to 25 percent cost savings, just not doing um, what we did. And please note that Northern Arizona, Northern Idaho, are adding sports um, in the future, starting next year. So our half a million dollar travel budget would need to increase significantly to add all the other sports to travel to Northern Idaho. So we haven't calculated that as well. So quite a bit of cost savings. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then just. For the record, in our briefing material, it says a, an estimated of about $60,000 annually savings. Thank you. At this time, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations. Aye. Item number seven, upcoming vacancy in the Office of President for CSN. Chancellor Charlton. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for the record. Patty Charlton, Interim Chancellor, Nevada System of Higher Education. And so this item before you today is an information item only, um, and at a subsequent date would be bringing back a name of an acting president to serve at the College of Southern Nevada. As you know, uh, President Zaragoza announced his retirement, which is effective on June the 30th of 2024. And so what the goal is, is to utilize the services of the registry, which is a premier um, executive placement firm specializing in higher education um, that draws from a pool of uh, individuals that have been vetted through that process uh, that serve as members um, within the higher education environment, either serving as former presidents, chancellors, um, providing services to, to institutions across the country. And so um, I wanted to see if there were any questions, but by doing this process, we would be able to initiate immediately, bring back to the board at a special meeting, 
an acting president's name. Um, that we would have the ability also for someone to work, um, hopefully, uh, prior to Dr. Zaragoza retiring on June 30th, to have some overlap with what I would say is your largest um, institution from a student headcount perspective, and then to benefit from, from his um, experience and his leadership as we look at a transition. And then at that time, also the board would be able to move forward on a, uh, a recruitment process and a search based on uh, the direction of the board and the chair creating a committee and determining the next steps in the process. So with that, I did also want to let you know that we have an individual online with us. Her name is Karen Whitney, and Karen is with the registry and uh, would be available also um, should I not be able to answer the questions. But I think the important part is these are individuals that have been vetted, have gone through um, all kinds of uh, rigor to become a member of the registry. And so um, thank you in advance uh, for consider or just for this information opportunity. Thank you. I have a re uh, quest question from Regent Del Carlo first. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, just two questions that I have. Um, since I've been on the board, I'm in my eighth year. When have we used the registry before? I mean, I think it's great we're doing that. And I do know that uh, our former president of UNR, who was the late Joe Crowley, he, after being president for 17 years, he was on the registry. So that's the caliber of president you're going to get. So I do want to make that, I, that question. And then I'm really glad we're doing this because I don't think this board's ever asked for a uh, report back since we went to the multi-campus model. I think I'm the only one on the board that was made that vote back in 17. I think it was 20, yeah, 2017. And it would be really wonderful. This is where I come from with fresh eyes to have somebody that has no dog in the fight, no hunt in the game, whatever, to come in and evaluate what it is you're doing, what's great about the multi-campus model, what maybe is not great about the multi-campus model, how it could be better, how it could be changed because they'll have a, a just fresh, those fresh eyes coming in and they're not trying to appeal to any one group or whatever. So I think this is a really good plan. I appreciate you coming up with this idea and um, I think we're gonna get a, a robust search because of it. And, and the cream of I have said before, will rise to the top for whoever puts in for the permanent position. So um, just on the registry, just, do you know uh, Interim Chancellor Pat, uh, Charlton? Patty, it's okay. <laughs> Patty, I don't want to call you Patty. Yeah. So uh, again, for the record, Patty Charlton, Interim Chancellor. So to my experience, the, the system has not used the services of the registry in the past. They have, however, used other services, and we did engage in conversation for example, with another um, group, the timing was just a little bit longer, and that was ACCT. And I do know that the system has used those for an interim placement, or I'm sorry, I'm going to use the term acting, because this individual would not be eligible to apply for the permanent position. And so no, they haven't used that. Um, I don't know if Joe Crowley is still a part of the registry at this point, but that would be interesting. <laughs> he passed away. He passed I'm sorry. away. Uh -huh. I, I didn't mean that. Ago. So yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Regent Boylan. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. Uh, Interim Chancellor, we, we talked about this, you and I. And I, I thank you for explaining some things to me, but I'm still a wee bit confused. So we would spend money to get someone who can't be the permanent president of the college. We'd be spending money for someone to just come in and, you know, just fill the gap for a while because they can't be applying for the president position, permanent position, right? Am I getting that right? So um, for the record, Patty Charlton, um, through you, uh, Chair Carvalho. So actually the way that the, the structure of payment terms works with the registry is actually a cost neutral to the cost of the current president. So um, between the salary and or the benefits, we would not pay anything more than that. Um, there may be some consideration because somebody will be coming here potentially from out of state to serve in that capacity. Um, this individual would not be eligible to apply. And I would say also that the other part is that there, there is some, some wonderful talent 
within the institution and within the system that may be that may be interested to apply for that that presidential position once the profile is determined and the search is underway. And so it does give a fair opportunity for anyone um, who aspires to that position as well. Sure, but I, I maybe I just I should rephrase my question then. Uh, we would be paying for someone to just gap fill fill the gap till we find someone or we start the search for a full-time president is what I'm trying to get at. Is we, that what it is? So yes, we would be paying for a president, but we would okay. be paying for somebody to serve in that, that capacity. We have to yeah. have an interim, an acting president so, to lead the ship. No, what I'm trying to say is why, have we, why would we do this to get someone in for the, we know he's not going to be the president. We waste all that time. He gets training, paying two presidents, President Zergosa and him, overlapping. But then he won't stay with us because he cannot stay with us and he'll have to leave after so much time till we get a full president. Now I know there's like 10 or 12 or 8 vice presidents who could run that place pretty good under your guidance, I'm sure, and the board. So why do? what's the need to have a person from the registry who would spend all that time and get all that money and experience and paid? Mm -hmm and they can't be the full-time president. Certainly. So first, just to clarify, the overlap we're estimating is perhaps 30 days um, of time, um, and that's really to, to that, position yes. the institution in the best way with um, having the, the opportunity to engage with President Zaragoza, um, specifically about strategic opportunities, priorities, um, budgetary issues. We've got a legislative session, so they'll be able to have at least some time to deep dive with the president. And I think that that's very helpful. And then obviously, yes, I would be here as well. And then they, they do have a, a strong leadership team. So I think that the benefit is that we have um, somebody that comes in that can do this and they won't just be a placeholder. They will be leading the institution serving in the position of president while the search is underway and the board will determine um, the launching of that search, the committee and the process um, as far as a national, regional or local search, which is at the, the discretion of the board. So we're talking a very short, limited time sure. of overlap um, yes. and that's really uh, to strategically yeah, no. and put the best, the institution in the best light forward. Okay, okay. I, I get that. But again, it comes back to me asking this question. You said the right word. Thank you, placeholder. Last time we were choosing three uh, chancellors, I think it was. And uh, we didn't want any of them to, because they didn't hit the road running. We didn't say, okay, you can come in for a few months or so. To me, it's a waste of money, is what I'm trying to say. Because he's not going to be our guy or she. And they come in for a wee bit, get more experience, get paid big bucks, and then they're gone. That doesn't help ENSHI, that doesn't help the college, that doesn't help this board. When we have you, and we have so many presidents and vice presidents and all that kind of stuff, they can run the show. After President Zaragoza goes, I wish he wouldn't, but he'll be going. So why are we doing that? That's what I'm trying to clear in my head. People have asked me this also. That's why I asked you this earlier when we talked. But you haven't cleared it for me, so could you help me here or somebody else before council tells me I have to ask these questions in new business. <laughs> so could you clear that? Why would we want to fill in this position when we have so much talent, vice presidents, who would run the show? Well, so I guess I would ask a couple or, or just respond um, as follows. So first, if we have an acting president that's from within the institution, or if you have an interim president, that person does go forward and then that would eliminate or not based on your current policy um, the process for a national or, or any recruitment um, and they would be in that place. Um, the institution I think has has opportunities for, for bringing in someone to help to, to set the course as we move forward. Um, all of our institutions have shared how lean they are um, and to have somebody do two jobs I will tell you it can be very very difficult but again this gives an opportunity to have a fair opportunity um, for anyone who's interested, and, and there is a lot of talent, um, as as you have said, and I and I would concur on that. But to go forward with a national search to get the right person to lead. The
the institution. Um, you've heard from, from faculty and others, and so uh, about their desire for um, a search, and so moving forward, and that they could be also a part of that process. And so um, I would just say that that, that would be the, the reason, and um, that's why I'm bringing forward this recommendation in consultation with the chair and the vice chair. All right, thank you, ma'am. The more I learn, the less I know. I, I'm really confused now, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from Regents? Regent uh, Brooks. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. Now, I'll, I'll ask for your indulgence. I do have a few questions, but I'll ask one or two, and then we can come back to the board so I'm not, you know, maybe my questions will be answered by somebody else posing the questions. Um, interim Chancellor, in terms of the... Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, just yeah. said yes, sir. Oh, all right. <laughs> And, 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 and maybe this question is for the representative from the, the uh, registry, but in terms of the registry specifically, what is the member cost for an executive to be part of that registry? And then is there some type of public list of those members who are currently in the state of Nevada? I'm going to ask, um, thank you, uh, Regent Brooks, for that question. I'm going to ask Karen Whitney if she could please respond, and I'd like to introduce Karen Whitney from the registry. Uh, Karen. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, good afternoon, Regents. It's an honor to be with you on such an important topic, uh, particularly since I myself has ser have served as a president of a university and as an interim president and interim chancellor throughout my career, and now I do placements with the registry. In terms of member costs, members do not pay to be members. Uh, they have to, but we use the word member and membership because one cannot just simply, like when I end, uh, was it, beginning to end my term at Clarion University in Western Pennsylvania in uh, 2018, I just couldn't call up the registry and say, hey, I want to be a member, I'm a president. Uh, instead, I had to apply, much like any uh, competitive position, and I was very much vetted with extensive reviews of what I had done and how well I had done it. And all, if you think about the most rigorous search process you might consider, that's what the registry put me through. And that's what we've put our, at any given time, we have about five to 600 members through. So no, I did not pay money to present. I presented my credentials, I was interviewed, and I was professionally and rigorously vetted. So I hope, uh, Regent, that answers your first question. In terms of a public list, uh, we do not have a public list on our website. Uh, I would have to work with the chancellor to understand what uh, regions you would need. And then I would work with the president of our registry to meet that need. Um, so I, I can't offer you that right now. We have at any point in time, five to 600 members. Uh, that we originated as a uh, interim, we use the word interim, acting's fine, uh, interim leadership placement uh, dedicated first to presidents and chancellors over 30 years ago. Now we provide placements uh, throughout the country uh, at, the, at that level, as well as other cabinet positions of vice president, provost, dean, and now what I'll call directors in, in really critical point areas such as financial aid or HR, athletics, things like that. So we go where the higher ed industry goes. We only focus on higher ed. Uh, 95 plus percent of our work is interim placement leadership. We do have a small consulting practice because many of our interims are asked by clients to do consulting. So I hope that answers the question and I'm available to answer any more. Thank you, Regent Birch, for the record. That that did answer my question. I, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll turn it back over to, to the chair and the board and then um, I, I do have a few more questions. Thank you, Chair. And if I could, um, Chair Carvalho, I would also just like to say that as uh, Karen Whitney um, provided, they do other types of placements such as deans and, and financial aid directors. In fact, um, uh, Nevada State University has actually used the services of the registry in the past for um, some assistance with an interim dean placement. So I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to Vice Chair Downs. Thank you, Chair Carvalho. Uh, Vice Chair Downs, for the record. Um, if I'm allowed to, I don't want to violate some rule, but um, <laughs> please stop me if I'm going in the wrong direction. But in response to uh, Regent Boylan, uh, you asked the question, and, and Dr. Uh, Whitney, please feel free to correct me if I say something that's not accurate. But one of the benefits of uh, going with a person that's part of the registry was that you have someone who has had the experience, they know what they're doing, 
they can come in and give an assessment of the CSN situation and some directions that, that they may want to make changes or, su or suggest the changes. And it's not someone who wants to be there permanently, but they just want a short-term um, engagement that then we can proceed with the search process. So it's, it's coming in with someone that's not being trained that is fully up to speed on how to be um, an executive level manager. So that's, that was what we were, I would say that's what kind of sold me on going with the registry over other options. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Regent, if I could yeah. confirm, we only uh, allow members who've held the position previously. I could not have been an interim chancellor if I had not been, and that was at a single campus, you know, words mean different, if I had not previously and successfully held that position. That is a requirement of the registry. Thanks, ma'am. Oh, by the way, we don't do placeholders. Uh, we don't do placeholders. We are consequential leaders that are serious about <laughs> coming in and meeting the needs of the chancellor and the board. Uh, no, no institution can waste time. So we are serious about consequential transitional leadership. Awesome. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Jeff. Uh, Vice Chair Downs, I appreciate that. What I was thinking of is, and like I said, I'm a simple man. I just ask simple questions. We have an OIC, an officer in charge, when we don't have a chancellor. We don't go to the registry or to the bureau or to any other place to find somebody till we find the permanent chancellor. Why don't we have that in the college system? And if it's a question of policy, two thirds, we can make a new policy, Madam Chair. But why bring in someone and spend all that money and time when we could have an officer in charge? We've got 10 pre vice presidents. Are they not fit to take over from the president? Then why are they vice presidents? So that's what I'm getting at. Why do we need somebody to do that when we could have an officer in charge and save entry and taxpayers money? That is my issue. Is, I'm allowed to ask that, uh, Council, right? Thank you, ma'am. So I'm, I'm safe there. That, that was it, ma'am. I'm trying to save money, as usual, and do what's best for Enshi, officer in charge. So, so um, Regent Boylan, I, I think I would add that uh, to, to serve as an officer in charge and do double duty can be very difficult for any, for any, any leader, especially, um, I'm, I appreciate, but uh, there's a lot of work that's to be done. We're heading into, um, obviously, there will be a new fall semester underway, a new academic year. Um, I know the institution, as we, we've heard, also has, um, they're working very closely with the Northwest Commission on colleges and universities, on their accreditation responses. We've got a budgetary environment, a legislative session. That's a lot to do to do two positions and an officer in charge is doing that in addition to their other jobs. So to have someone that is trying to mind being an acting president, because that's really, they have all the, the roles and responsibilities as well as their other job, that's very difficult. And especially with an institution as large and, and I would say very complex. And I, and I think I can say that um, with some informed information about the, the College of Southern Nevada. And so I, I think it's also to, to help that institution as well. Thank you. Are there any other questions from Regents? I, uh, Regent McMichael. Yes. Uh, I am not opposed to a nationwide search. Uh, my philosophy is you always uh, try and promote within, and we have a, a large group of talented individuals. Again, uh, uh, along with uh, 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 Regent Boylan, I believe in saving money also. So if the pool that's available to us within NC uh, does not suffice and cannot be promoted, a nationwide search then would be the option. Thank you. 
certainly, um, Richard McMichael, just, just to add, it does not preclude in any way um, from the, the committee that is established by this board to determine if they want to do a local search, a regional search, or a national. In fact, you could even, I think, uh, an idea was, was floated at one point to scale that, start, start locally, but it would still give the opportunity for multiple people to have that opportunity and to do a search and to uh, facilitate that process with the committee of the board and the advisory committee as prescribed by your policy. I, I would also like to add that we did hear from faculty very clearly that they really did want to search. Um, and so we, we felt that this was a good opportunity to allow that to take place. So I, I hear your concerns. I, I understand them. I had some of the same concerns. The, the cost to this is, is not as large as, as we originally, I think some of us may have thought. Um, it's, it is cost neutral in terms of, of the president, um, whoever is in that space. Um, there, there'll, there will be that small amount of overlap. I think that's best for, for uh, good business practices. Um, but I feel confident that this gives us the best opportunity to find the best person when we do go for a full search. Thank you. Um, Regent Brooks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Regent Brooks, for the record. The, uh, I know we brought up cost a couple of times. Um, Interim Chancellor, can you just let me know, is it uh, CSN that would be paying for this, or would it be the system that's paying for it? Um, thank you, Regent Brooks, for the question. Um, it would be CSN. Um, and that would be the same as as you go forward on a search, the institution does bear the cost of the search as well. And that's um, also prescribed in the policy. But, but the position of president is paid by each institution. Um, pertaining to the, just the, the, the agenda item itself, um, I'm a little bit surprised um, in terms of the, the way that um, this would move forward, only in that it's a complete departure from what uh, we experienced in November and December, mm -hmm. where there were various stakeholder conversations at CSN with, with faculty members and others, um, who at, at that time, uh, the majority of those folks um, that we spoke to, um, Interim Chancellor, um, were looking for more of a solution that came from with inside the campus um, and had echoed that an interim uh, president would serve the institution best. Now, that may not be the opinion of, of, of some um, over at the institution, but certainly that was a prevailing opinion that, that took place. And so this is a little bit different, actually a lot different than what we uh, had, had worked through. Um, the other question that I, I recognize that was more of a comment than anything else. The other question I have, though, in terms of our policy for when there is a vacancy with a president, um, particularly if it is a foregone conclusion that a president is getting ready to leave, it seems like the, the policy dictates the, the role of chancellor to suggest somebody in either an interim or acting capacity for that institution. And if there is going to be any type of search, then that would be up to the board to determine what that would look like. And I'm trying to understand in using the registry, is that, are we looking at the registry as merely a consultant to provide guidance? Um, or could this be considered a search that is taking place? Because the registry would then have to go through the executives or prior presidents they may have of various institutions that would fit the role of what, what is needed over at CSN. And that's where I'm getting a little stuck in terms of where the policy is, um, because this seems like it is, could be considered a search. So, so thank you, Regent Brooks, for that question, and I appreciate um the opportunity to respond. So what the registry will be doing is to, pr to help us to, to obtain um, individuals that would be qualified to serve in that position as, and I'm going to use the term acting president, and then again, um, 
this is an information item, so because this is something that's a little bit different than, than what you've seen before, um, we will then bring back to this body an actual name. So I will be bringing back in consultation um, as the policy adheres to an acting president with a name um, in consultation with the chair of the board for final approval of this body. Regent Brooks, for the record again, thank you, Interim Chancellor. I, I, I appreciate that, and perhaps this is something for special counsel to weigh in on. I'm not, I'm not really sure because it seems to me like we're clouding what is a, a consultant providing guidance or what could be a consultant um, using a search process to provide guidance. And either way, in policy, that, would, that is something that would come from the board, not, not an interim chancellor or a chancellor. Michael Wixon, for the record. Uh, Chair Brooke, uh, Regent Brooks, I'm sorry. Uh, what, what's being proposed today really isn't a change to policy. It's, it fits within the overall policy the, board's, uh, the board has utilized. If the board approves this process and a board approves the appointment of uh, an acting chancellor from the registry, it, it's not really modifying any search policies. It wouldn't be adjusting any search policies. Uh, you would be making that determination as the board to engage in this process. So in that regard, I'm not sure of the question because, it, again, that would be the decision that's being made by the board and you're implementing the policies in accordance with your policies and procedures. Thank you, uh, Regent Brooks, again, for the record. I, Sure, and maybe it's just the language that's being used, right? Or the way that the language is written in policy regarding specifically a search or a consult consultant being brought in and that you would need two thirds vote from the board to have that approval of the search committee or a consultant to be brought in. And, and that's where I think I'm trying to determine where is, if, if a registry is, registry is being used, would that not be the same as a consultant? And if so, would that not require a two thirds vote and if, it's, if they're not considered a consultant, would they be part of a search to bring somebody forward so that the interim chancellor can then go through that list of names and then bring someone forward uh, to the board for consideration? Uh, may I respond? Michael Wixon for the record. It's not the search, the registry wouldn't be acting as a consultant and it wouldn't be part of a search process. You would just be appointing an act, in effect an acting president. That's all you're doing. And so it's not, and it shouldn't be construed to be a search, and it shouldn't be, and, and neither should the registry be construed to be a consultant in that regard, because that's not what you're doing. You're just, in effect, appointing an acting president. Uh, thank you, Regent Brooks, again, for the record. I, I, I appreciate the, the, the answer. I don't, I don't have any other questions, Chair. Thank you. I did also want to just kind of, uh, clarify for the record that the registry does not do searches um, themselves. And so as you go forward, they would not be a part of the process when you determine the process and if a consultant will be used, which would be a determination of the board. But they do not do that process. Thank you. Regent, Regent McMichael and then Regent Boylan. So from what I understand, the registry is a list of qualified applicants that can fill the position immediately. Is that correct? That's correct, Regent McMichael. All right, thank you. Regent Boylan. Thank you, Madam Chair, with your permission and your kind permission, I should say, and that of Interim Chancellor Charlton. Could we have a few of the faculty that are present here tell us what they really decided and what they wanted. Is, is that possible to ask for that through the chair's permission? To really see, I mean, let's hear it from the horse's mouth. None of you look like horses. You're really handsome and pretty, but can we hear it from the horse's mouth? Because they'd be living with them. Patrick, you're a troublemaker. Come on up. Oh, is that appropriate? Horse. I think there's a few people here from CSN. It's uh, uh, yeah, Associate General that? Counsel Linda King, the, uh, to allow comment would be in the chair's discretion. That's what I said with your yes. please kind permission. Yes, we can Thank do you. that. And, and just so you know, Chancellor Charlton has reached out to um, some different yes. members of the CSN community to, 
to... Yeah, I'm sure. Yes, okay. ma'am. Yes, ma so, no, yes, no, no, we, no. Can, we and, can... And just that. for the record, I, I do want to be sure as well, that includes uh, President Zaragoza, and so I really want to thank him um, for his input in this process as well. So, um, I will step aside. Interim Chancellor, if I may say something, I'm, I, I know you've spoken to them also, and I'm not in favor of nepotism and passing friends on into promotion. So the registry or something else, no, I'm just saying. It's not that I'm saying we shouldn't have this. All right? That we could have this, but it's expenses to me, someone from the outside coming. And I want to hear from the staff here. Oh, no, absolutely. And, okay. and I haven't spoken to any specific person, just for the record, okay. other than the, um, the team from the registry in consultation with the chair and the vice chair. Thank you, ma'am. Patrick Villa, the faculty senate chair at CSN. Thank you for allowing me to share some opinions. Um, you know, our faculty are all in favor of an acting. We definitely are. And we've had the discussion, interim or acting. It's, it's not 100%, but it's a high, high majority that want the acting. Um, other, I've been in other meetings where we've talked. I've heard interim come around. And a lot of times it's by somebody who wants to be the interim, somebody who wants their friend to be the interim. And, and I'll disagree with you, Regent Boylan, about having 10 to 12 VPs who can do this job. I don't think that number is accurate. We have 10 to 12 VPs. We don't have 10 okay. to 12 that, that can do this job. <clears throat> and part of why I think enacting is good is it'll give, as, as Chancellor Charlton said, a chance to look at the whole thing and see what needs to be fixed. It's really hard to fix things when you are one of the things that needs to be fixed, for, for lack of better words. So, um, like I said, faculty, we really, you know, I mean, 100%, we'd rather have had a permanent search done already, yeah. and someone already hired, we'd be voting, you would be voting on that today, and we'd have a person ready on July 1. Right. That ship has sailed, so we're hoping that this acting is the best way and then we get that act that permanent president asap you know the search on that one but we like the acting and the registry is a great quick idea and, and as we've said they're qualified experienced people who can come in here with the fresh eye and see you know because csn has been how we are for many years and we need some fresh perspective someone who can do the job and not have to train on it so last question man last question thank you so yeah, you stay there, stay there, stay there. Right. Uh, oh yeah, please, uh, Ms. Cosgrove, come, uh, Dr. Cosgrove. So uh, my, my question was, do you want someone acting from the outside? Or are you asking for acting amongst your own who are there, who know the system, who may or may not be qualified? I cannot judge that. So you, you, you're okay with the registry and someone from the yes. outside coming in? Correct. Somebody outside of CSN, I think, is the best thing at this point. Okay. You know, whether it's there is a person in ENCHI, I don't know, because I don't know enough of the other institutions, but outside of the CSN family, I think, is what we need at this point. Thank you. Acting. Thank you, Dr. Vila. Dr. Sandra Cosgrove, I'm a history professor at the College of Southern Nevada. I'm a former faculty senate chair. I'm a former NFA president. Um, so I'm somebody that's not just been in the classroom. I'm somebody that talks with faculty and staff quite a bit. We have problems at CSN. And I would prefer that we discreetly handle the problems with somebody from the outside, as opposed to airing dirty laundry through the press or through having to have somebody get whistleblower status. If you pick somebody on the in, that's on the inside, you could be picking somebody that's part of the problem. So we would prefer to have someone that's completely objective on the inside that would have power such as an inspector general, that they could go in and do an investigation quietly and discreetly and work with the people that I talk to quite a bit and then make recommendations to you and the next president that's coming in. But I can tell you this stuff is going to come out one way or another. I would prefer that it come out discreetly. Thank you. Dr. Arnold Bell, Professor of Communication, former faculty senate chair as well. Change is an operative word. And I think there are certain individuals who are hesitant to embrace change because there is desperate need of change within the institution called the College of Southern Nevada. So when you look internally with the various candidates that we see are VPs, there's a lack of distrust that 
there's a considerable amount of distrust better yet that faculty members like myself, I've been there for about 20 years and Patrick's been there for quite a long time. And what's so important about this conversation when Regent Brooks as well as interim Charton came to our actual meeting, there was a considerable amount of individuals that expressed the importance of having an action. So when we had this here vetted, when we had this meeting like in November, only one candidate name came up when there was a gentleman named Doug Sims name that was actually said to as well at this meeting. And there was an open amount of individuals with the faculty senate chair, as well as Dr. Cosgrove can admit that they say, yes, we in agreement with that person. Now, even though you guys brought James McCoy name to the actual meeting last time there, and there was a considerable amount of pushback from someone like myself and countless others, his name did not resonate. So when we keep hearing that there are other people that actually say that this person is actually qualified, like my colleague said here, those individuals are actually part of the problem. So how can you have someone resolve a problem that's perpetuating the problem at the institution? There's no knock against Dr. Zaragoza, none whatsoever, but if you're not walking or working in those institutional ranks and those individuals that are adamantly speaking out on behalf of other candidates, why not have a diversified approach? And a diversified approach does not mean about one's color, but the ideology that one's possessed. Why would we perpetuate someone so close of perpetuating cronyism and nepotism that one may perceive when the registry would take care of that? As I alluded to last time when I spoke here before this here honorable board, if Mr. McCoy or whoever the person that had been identified our institution, credentials on par, let them apply like everyone else, let the registry or whoever may be vetted in a very unbiased fashion and let the cream rise to the top. So to answer your question there, there's no one that this faculty feel as well as other stakeholders at this institution feel that there's a VP that addressed a multitude of issues. Now, if we stuck on trying to get someone internally, it's gonna be utter mayhem at CSN and we're all gonna have mud in our face. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I will um, ask, oh, okay, um, Regent Brooks. Thank you, Chair, I appreciate that. Um, there are a couple things that I wanted to bring up. I did not anticipate um, uh, during our meeting today that there would be uh, other things that we would hear regarding that agenda item, particularly from those representing CSN. Um, and there's just some things that I'd like to clarify uh, for the board and, and for others, frankly, who are, who are part of this conversation. Um, much like when we are, are talking to a body of students, Sometimes students are less likely to have very frank conversations with us, particularly depending on who might be in the room. Um, I, I found that similar uh, circumstances to take place um, at the institution. Um, when I was there for a few days with the interim chancellor to do various uh, interviews and, and, and have stakeholder conversations. And uh, there were plenty of folks who provided their comments outside of those um, meetings through telephone and, and email. There were uh, three names that came forward to the interim chancellor and I. Um, w one of the names that was consideration for um, acting had sent uh, in, in, had changed, ch changed uh, that person changed their mind and did not want to come forward as um, acting. Um, uh, while I will not present his name, he, he, he was somebody that was favored by uh, many faculty members. Um, Chair. Yeah. Uh, pardon the interruption. Um, yeah. Yes, Brooks, Council um, I, I wanna ensure that our, our discussions do not involve any um, identification of any individuals that have not signed an open meeting law waiver. We can't talk about qualifications or characteristics of any particular individual. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'm trying so hard to stay with inside those, those, those limits, right? But at the same time, educate those who, who could probably um, uh, use some additional guidance in terms of our process. Perhaps the board can consider that while we are hearing some voices today, there are other voices that exist outside of this room that, that, that do not feel the same way. That's just the way that it is. Um, what this does demonstrate, at least to me, is the amount of conflict that exists on that campus. And there is a lot of conflict um, 
on the campus, and there were many fractions of opinions and thoughts uh, that, that I witnessed during those, those several days. The interim chancellor and I uh, did not go into her office and throw names, throw darts at names um, in bringing someone forward. It, that was, there was purpose, um, and it was the will of others that encouraged us to bring someone forward. And so I will just, uh, I don't want to belabor, belabor this um, more than I have, and so I will just simply uh, leave it there, and I, I appreciate your indulgence, Chair. Thank you for those comments, uh, Regent Brooks. Uh, Regent Del Carlo, I apologize for not calling on you earlier. No, pro no problem. Thank you, Chair Carvalho. I just want to just uh, send my colleagues to the registry. The website really explains a lot of the questions that you had, Regent Boylan. And um, this is a practice just because we haven't done it before. It's done all over the country, all over the world. I mean, we're a higher ed, but it's done in, in corporations and other businesses, too, that they have placements for many of the reasons Inter Interim Chancellor has um, said and the three um, faculty members from CSN. I find it, I think it's a very healthy thing that they're doing. It does show that we are listening. We may not have gone out of the gate listening, but we circled around and we're listening. And um, I, I think we're, especially since this process didn't start, had the process for a new president started, and we all know, having been in higher ed, that there is a time frame. We've missed the boat. So this is the best option that we have. And I've read through their website, and I agree with uh, Ms. Whitney that it, they're very highly vetted. I mean, this is not for the faint of heart, okay? These are tough cooker pressure jobs coming in. So you're coming into a new community, maybe even a new state, and you've got all these years of experience and you know you're not gonna get the permanent job. So you can come in with those fresh eyes. You can make some hard decisions. You have, you're not gonna be swayed by anything. You're, you're gonna come in and wanna do what's right for the institution. So I'm really proud that we're going this way. And uh, I know I was on the board when the president left UNLV and the person that came in was acting and then later it was so successful the acting that the board did come back and change that from an acting to an interim. I mean that person ended up not even applying for the permanent position but so I feel it's always best if we're going to do it really to start out acting cuz this board can always change it. So that's just my perspective on seven years of watching presidents and chancellors be hired. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Del Carlo. I am not hearing. Oh, I do see that Regent Cruz Crawford has her uh, hand up. Thank you so much, Chair. Regent Cruz Crawford, for the record. I apologize. I was late to the meeting. I was at a funeral. Um, I just want to say um, on behalf of myself as a region, just um, really just say that I'm uh, proud that we, we took a churn like Regent Del Carlo did. It's important that we understand there are a lot of fractured relationships and the best way to repair those is to have an impartial um, person as we go through this process. And I apologize for, uh, you know, for the, the chaos that has ensued by not quickly and swiftly um, going through that um, pr hiring process. Um, but I do believe this is the best course of action to get someone that is the most qualified and um, the most equitable way of hiring. So thank you. Thank you, Regent Cruz Crawford. I will give uh, Chancellor Charlton one um, last moment to um, give any final remarks if she has any. No, I just want to thank everyone for their input and their thoughts today and then look forward to the next step, which will be bringing forward the name of an acting president at CSN. Thank you. We'll move on to item number eight, new business. Is there any new business? <clears throat> yes, I mean. Regent Boylan. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Council, if I just say... All the things I said before, and I was told to ask in 
new business. Can they be put in new business, please? Because I've forgotten what I said. I was enjoying. Oh, I can't do it then? Oh, because I was enjoying my cookies here. And uh, yeah, can that be done, Council? Uh, Michael Wick. Oh. <laughs> Okay, I'll identify it. All right. Now it's on the record somewhere. I think and Miss Palmer is typing. I presume. Are you sure okay. Uh, let me see. Yeah. All right. I was asking questions. It was mainly with the, the security report. Yes, yes. Now it's coming back to me. Uh, I wanted to know as a source of funding, can we? get the chancellor and council to find out if Metro can give us some of the money for the damage they did that, in my opinion, was totally useless and not needed. And why I base that on the fact, and this is uh, not substantial. I, I caution you, you the business, but you can't deliver. No, no, no. By I, Regent Boylan, you've identified your new business. Yeah. Any other discussion is a deliberative process. Okay, so discussion is between two people. We're going to go over that again. This is just me stating. I'm so cautioning you under penalties Thank of you. the open meeting law. You've Thank identified you. your new business. You're right, right, right. Okay, that's and, all you needed to do. Oh, yeah, but I'm, I'm not, it doesn't say that I cannot say more to give the whole picture of why I'm asking for this in new business. If we cannot discuss or deliberate but I can make substantive statements. And my no, statements, I'm saying you cannot make substantive you, statements. Are you actually saying that? This is my counsel to you, and okay. if you choose to ignore it, you're going to be violating the open meeting law. Now, that's your choice, but I've told you you can identify it, but if you make substantive statements, you're deliberating, and that's a violation of the open meeting law. That ultimately is your choice. Madam Chair, I, like I requested this before also, and I'll request it in you, that it comes up that Council Wixom explains to us why his idea is different from what's written out there that what we can or cannot do. It doesn't say anywhere that we cannot have substantive statements. It does say it right in discussion. new business that there is no substantive discussion. Discussion, that's that may exactly occur. what I'm saying. And I'm, that's what I'm trying to get to you. Discussion. Excuse me, we all educated people here. There's a big difference between discussion and statements. Discussion is between one, between two or more people. Statement okay. is uh, what I'm making. Is That's what I'm saying. I, I appreciate your perspective on that. Uh, just to move the meeting along, I'm just asking you to state what your what your new business is, just briefly what it is, not your reasonings for it or, or further discussion. I'm asking you to do that in order to further this meeting along. So for the sake of just furthering the meeting along, I cannot say what my new... Uh, uh, what's it called? Your new business. My well, new businesses. Is that what you're saying I, I, to me? No, I'm not. I, I'm saying that you have you have stated what it is, and I think we can move on from there. Okay, and I also want to put it on record that uh, Council Wixom, in my opinion, does not understand the difference between a discussion and statements. That is not part of the open meeting law. I read it carefully, and it's written right there. So. That's it. Thank you. Are there any other new business items? Yes, Regent Goodman. Chair Cavallo, thank you. Uh, my new business item. I believe that often our handbook and associated policies are a hindrance rather than a help to facilitate our fiduciary responsibility to the Nevada system of higher education. Therefore, I would like to request the formation of a committee composed of representatives from system administration, campus administration, and representatives of shared governments to consider governance, to consider the hiring of a consultant to undertake a formal review of all Board of Regents policies, thus the handbook, and bring recommendations to the board to update, simplify, consolidate, and better align board policy with governance best practices and the mission and goals of the Nevada system of higher education. Thank you, Regent Goodman. Any other new business? Regent McMichael. Yes, um, I, I would like uh, for an agenda item to come up 
uh, to discuss why we haven't repeat, why wasn't the repeal of the NC Code Title II, Chapter 12, uh, which uh, eliminates the vaccine uh, information in the employee's records. If that could uh, be agendized, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Regent McMichael. Any other new business? Seeing none, I will move to public comment. Um, we'll ask for public comment at the meeting sites first. Is there any public comment at GBC? There is no public comment at GBC. Thank you. Is there any public comment at the system office in Reno? I didn't miss it. None in Reno. Thank you. I do see that. Oh, there is one in Reno? No, it looks like Cruz Crawford has her hand up. Oh, uh, Regent Cruz Crawford, did you have your hand up? Uh, it looks like she disappeared. Okay. Um, oh, I, I apologize. That's okay. Okay. Is there any public comment here in Las Vegas? Patrick Villa, CSN Faculty Senate Chair. Um, I'm going to say one thing. I'm going to say it every meeting until my term ends in June 30th, is that I implore you all to consider starting our permanent president search now and not later. That's all for me. Thank you. Hello, Board of Regents. Teresa Marie with UNLV GPSA. Um, I am the treasurer. I never really write notes, so bear with me because I think I'm more nervous now than when I don't. Um, so this is in regards to December 6th. Um, on December 12th, I stood before you and I asked that you listen to faculty, staff, and students as we live on campus and we live the fallout of the event. Um, days following the shooting, myself and the other leaders of UNLV were facilitating concerns of returning to campus while trying to navigate our own healing. President Thomas took the brunt of those concerns. Um, and I appreciate her for that, and she inspires me daily. I received a message from a first-year grad student thanking GPSA for speaking at the 12th meeting and the virtual meeting held by GPSA following the December 6th event. They admitted that they had contemplated dropping out after the event. However, when they saw the swift response to student concerns and people looking out for faculty and staff, they decided to stay. They were set to take a class in BEH and were prepared to delay their program if they had to, if classes remained in that building. If you have students dancing around a building and delaying their program, we know the longer they take, the more likely they are not to graduate. And I realize that if you are not living campus, UNLV campus every day, that what we are asking may not make sense because to some, that is just a building with a lot of classrooms. But for many others, that is a building that involuntarily forced all of our UNLV faculty, staff, and students into the I Have Survived a Campus Shooting Club, which was a comment made at the following um, GPSA community group meeting. So those who are ready to go back to the building, it won't matter to them but it will make a difference to those who are still healing and processing. So as we move into this focus of mental health and making sure people are safe and they are comfortable, remember, anyone who is comfortable, the building will not matter, but those who are still healing, it will. Thank you. Dr. Bill Robinson, Chair of the University Faculty Senate. If you're not tired of me talking about these things, uh, you might be by the end of three more months or four more months I have left. Um, the reason BEH was, is still locked or was still locked is only because doors in that building were blasted open by mechanical devices and you could not let people into that building when half of the faculty offices were open and could not be locked down. Uh, the administration seemed like they wanted to reopen that building, which to me would have been a huge, huge, huge mistake. Um, we had a faculty member in their office late at night, again, with everything, 
they heard someone walking down the hall toward their office. This is only a week ago, 10 days ago. They heard someone walking down toward their office, stop outside their office. She started screaming. That is the way people still are. It was a friend of hers. He knocked on the door really quick and calmed her and got, and she's fine. But the, the reaction, we had fireworks at the Lady Rebels game. The, I have not stopped hearing people who are upset that we still had fireworks at the Lady Rebels game a week and a half ago. This is not, uh, and I, I, I kind of don't understand why. I'm the math guy. I teach math boot camp in the summer. My leadership are psych people, and I seem to be the one that keeps reminding them that it's the psychological impacts that they still need to deal with. The, the stuff that we have system-wide, the EAP program, the stuff we have for faculty is just not very good. Faculty are surviving, and there's hundreds of faculty that are still working with the Resiliency Center. There's thousands of students that are still working with the Resiliency Center and the campus programs. This is not a walk away from it, and we're fine. This is a serious long-term issue for lots of people. Thanks. Dr. Arnold Bell with the Department of Communication from the College of Southern Nevada. I just want to extend my emphatically empathetic views about what our colleagues have gone over at UNLV. To give you a brief background about myself, I'm a former veteran of the Gulf War that served in the United States Marine Corps, and I saw combat firsthand. And I don't envision that on no one to have to go through some of the things that I have to endure. But what we have to understand that there are certain triggers that these individuals are going to experience, like fireworks, loud noises, and whatever. And it took me a considerable amount of time, even to this day, I do not sleep as well. But while at the same time, I've managed it. But I want you to understand that these individuals are going through something there, and whatever you can do as the regions, please support my brothers and sisters over at UNLV, as well as our police department, because they did a phenomenal job in responding, but I do not envision on my worst enemy to be in the situation I was in when I was in the United States Marine Corps. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Seeing no more public comment here in Las Vegas, SCS, are there any comments on the phone line? There are no online callers at this time. Thank you. With that, we will adjourn this meeting at 201.